call upon Professor Madhumita Chattopadhyay to please come and respond to the paper by Professor Geshi Yeshi Thakke, who also unfortunately could not make it because of his illness. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I first want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Somte and Professor Gokhil for inviting me to this prestigious conference where, along with all the participants, I myself have been graced by the blessings of His Holiness Dalai Lama. I have been invited here as a respondent to the paper an analysis of the relationship between the body and the mind, uh, uh, written by Professor Geshe Yeshe Thapke. But unfortunately, after coming here, I came to know that Professor Thapke has been ill, and so he is not able, he has not been able to come here. So my task has become a bit awkward to respond to a paper which has not been presented. But the paper that, uh, has already been uh, distributed to all of you in the collection of articles. So I think that those who are interested in, uh, uh, in, all, in his articles have gone through it. So without wasting any time, I directly uh, will start with my responses. And in course of my responses, you might get some impression of what is written there in the paper. The paper, an analysis of the relationship between the body and the mind, addresses the question of the mind-body relationship by focusing on one particular issue, namely explaining the continuity of consciousness through changes in the body. This continuity is found to occur not only in one part, but often through different parts, and is needed to account for some facts in Buddha's life and also the life of ordinary persons. Professor Thapke does not directly state the problem, but starts his discussion by referring to a particular passage of the text Pramana Vartikam. Apparently, the relevance of such reference seems to be out of context, for Pramana Bhaktiko is a text on Buddhist epistemology, whereas the mind-body problem is a problem of metaphysics or ontology. However, the relevance becomes clear when you consider the context which our author has referred to. In the Pramana Siddhi chapter of this text, Pramana Bhaktiko, Dharmakirti, while enumerating the you know, number of Pramanas, points out that Lord Buddha has to be considered as a Pramana, like the other two Pramanas, Pratyaksha and Anumana, and justifies his claim with different reasons or tetus, like Gyanotto, possessing knowledge, Hyopadeo Vedakotto, that is knowing what is to be attained and what is to be rejected, Karunikotto, that is being compassionate, etc. It is with regard to the reason, karunikotto, that the relation between body and mind becomes evident. Koruna or compassion is the most important quality to be cultivated according to Buddhism. And we have heard from the morning, since the morning, from His Holiness Dalai Lama about this Koruna cultivation of this corona. It is because of this corona that the bodhisattvas refuse to attain the stage of nirvana and remain in the stage of arhatva. Buddha in both the Hinojana and Mahajana traditions is looked upon as one who is very much moved by the sufferings of ordinary beings and out of the desire to remove that suffering accepted Koruna as a means or upaya. 
this means is accepted by dharma kirti as a process or as a province or reason to establish the authority of buddha with regard to compassion the question arises how can compassion be exhibited in the highest degree in by buddha in answer it is said that it arises out of practice seeing pain in others buddha wanted to remove their suffering and so he started practicing compassion to all but compassion cannot be exhibited to all at once it has to be cultivated slowly first towards oneself then towards one's near ones and gradually towards all including one's enemies such cultivation requires obviously long practice which often continues over different parts it is in the context of cultivation of such corona through different parts that important issues regarding mind come to focus compassion has been defined as sarva trane chha lakshana that is huh? 10 minutes only Can you please wind up because we are really running out of time. I'm so sorry. Okay, just uh, yeah, just Now so uh, compassion uh, is the desire to save or protect uh, uh, all people. Now uh, the question arises the cultivate the fact regarding the cultivation of conscious state is explained with reference to the past habits or habits generated by actions of past lives. However, the problem still remains as to how the consciousness of the last moment of past life, technically called the chuti chitta, gets related to the first moment of consciousness of the present life, called the puti shundi chitta. Dharma Kirti himself does not address this question directly, though his commentator Pugyakaru Gupta tries to provide an answer to this problem by referring to the case of dream experience. Just as some, let us one two minutes. just as some dangerous object seen in the middle of dream can produce the feeling of fear in the waking state even though dream state and waking states are two different states similarly the desires generated by past actions in the previous life can result in different activities in the subsequent life one reason for dharmakirti is not addressing this question may be that his text is primarily concerned with praman in spite of prokakara gupta's endeavor the, uh, the analogy of dream cannot satisfactorily explain the continuity of states of consciousness over different parts as such professor geshe thapke in his paper text refuge to the tantric text especially to the gujjo samadha tantra where the connection between the different lives of an individual has been explained with the help of wind energies this explanation of thapke nicely accounts for the basic question raised by dharma kirti as to how the compassion of the buddha in one single word can be cultivated to such a level that it can be exhibited to all even to one's enemy thus the merit of his paper lies in the fact that he does not confine himself to the buddhist texts and commentarial literature only but blends them with folk tales and reports of ordinary experiences to provide a satisfactory explanation of the relationship between body and mind however there is one problem the basic contention of thapke's paper is to deal with the problem of rebirth or continuity of consciousness over different parts to explain the relationship between body and mind for addressing this problem he concentrates mainly on the commentary martika lankaro of proka karagupta as secondary to the tantric text we do not find reference to other mohajano texts on this matter for example the text shantanantara siddhi of dharmakirti himself deals exclusively on the issue of the continuity of the individual through the functional functional stream similarly the text madhyamaka avatar of chandrakirti also contains discussion in this regard it would have been better for the hearers if the author did address the problem from the standpoint of these two texts 
rather than from the proanobacterium, which is basically a text of epistemology. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chattopadhyay. Uh, I can just allow one question. Anybody who wants to ask a question? <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to open up uh, uh, this uh, session now to all our speakers, moderators, and discussants to give their feedback, comments, or observations um, regarding you know this two-day conference that we had. Just be very brief. We have about five minutes to do this. Yes. Sorry, I was wondering. You had a question. Speak in the mic, please. Okay. During the panel, um, there has been a consensus that when we're talking about consciousness, it's not mind and it's not body, it's something else. Um, and then somebody during the panel brought up that when we're talking about one cell in an individual, we can't see the effect of another virus. We have to look at a collection of cells. So my question is, isn't this panel evidence that there is consciousness itself because everyone has their own mind on this panel? We're all discussing something and we're all using different perspectives, different languages, different religious perspectives, but in the end of the day, there's some kind of consensus where we're able to understand one another. And so isn't the fact that there are several minds, different minds present, but they're under the umbrella of consciousness, isn't that evidence in itself of what we're talking about? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so. In Indian philosophy, not only in Indian philosophy, in our ordinary experience, we find that there is a difference between conscious objects and unconscious objects. So, the fact of consciousness has to be admitted because this is the fact which distinguishes human beings, or rather, we must say, living beings, from non living ones. But how to account for this consciousness? How to explain the nature of this consciousness? That is the I think that is the main problem uh, which has been addressed in this two, in this two day seminar. Now, each uh, system of Indian philosophy, they have their own assumptions, uh, 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 which we might compare with the axioms of other scientific systems. So in accordance with, that, uh, with those uh, uh, accepted theories, they are trying to explain consciousness. That's why one theory of consciousness differs fundamentally from that of another theory proposed by another school. For example, the you have heard yesterday from Professor Bondavadhyay about the school of Vedanta system, about the school of Vedanta. The Vedanta believes an eternal, an eternal entity. But whereas the Buddhists do not believe in any such permanent or eternal entities. So how to, how can these two schools with two different philosophical backgrounds explain consciousness? Certainly their explanation will be different. That's why we have two different interpretations. Thank you. Comment? Yes. Okay, uh, I will make comment which are some in general and also some specific answering some questions which were raised by the audience. I'll be honest with you, even though I'm listening to everybody, uh, great speakers and I enjoy all that, but at the end of the day I, I feel very confused. I'll be very honest with you. I, I feel very confused when I hear all the talks and the, my main comment will be that uh, when we are talking about consciousness, it's a very big word and you need to define what kind of consciousness you are talking about. On one hand, like from Buddha's side, we are talking about the consciousness uh, which is mental, which also has a subtle consciousness which goes from one life to the other. That consciousness has an analytical capabilities. It also has attributes of anger, jealousy, love, and all that. Within that framework, it can interact. And 
and develop things out of it. Now on the other hand, you talk about consciousness which is like a, everything has a consciousness. Well, if you want to generalize the definition of consciousness, yes, it is true. But how far do you want to generalize? I mean, I can even say every atom has a consciousness. So is the field, electric and magnetic field, associated with any atom? If I call it a consciousness, yes, everything has a consciousness. I mean, I'm not a great Hindu philosopher, so within that realm I can call it, it is a cosmic consciousness. So it, so it will help quite a lot that all of us should define when we say, I'm talking about this consciousness and this is what I'm trying to say, it will make a lot of sense. And so uh, to the audience, there was an earlier question that uh, it is all big capotoni. It may sound that way, uh, but overall there is a lot of information. But because of the terminology and the description and not defining the words, we get totally confused. And this is the problem in neuroscience and I find this problem between neuroscience and Buddhist philosophers also. And that's why each side has to learn other side's language and then define exactly what you want to talk about. Otherwise, it just becomes a big dialogue. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Jimpa? Um, I have uh, been part of uh, dialogues like, interdisciplinary dialogues like this quite a lot, thanks to my service to His Holiness as his interpreter. Um, and one thing that I have learned is that, um, you know, sometimes in a dialogue, there is a, a sort of an urge or tendency to look for commonalities and try to come together. That, I feel, is very well-meaning, but it's kind of not very helpful. Because where the richness really comes from is where there are points of contention and differences. Now sometimes the point of contention and differences really results from confusion of terminology. Those ideally should be avoided. But sometimes the intent contentions are genuine, like Atman and Anatman, that kind of thing. Um, so one of the things that I personally believe is you know, this kind of discussion is very important, both for the Indic traditions, which have engaged in this kind of inquiry for a long time, but that, but up until now, Indic traditions have referred, you know, engaged in this dialogue, in this kind of inquiry, primarily through critical reflection of philosophical thinking, inter-school debates, for clarification of your own concepts and standpoints and refinement and up to a point relating to yogi's experience. But it had never been able to look at these phenomena by way of referring to measurements from the scientific point of view. And this is what is very different now. And for the scientist, Sometimes there is a tendency to feel, well, what has been said about this phenomenon up until now is kind of useless. We don't need to even look at it. You know, we are the bearers of knowledge. We have a proven track record of getting things done and making things clear. And, you know, we have, we, we now have the tools. And that is also a form of arrogance. And so, Consciousness, and then yesterday in the, in the dialogue, the one point I was trying to make is that when you are dealing with consciousness, there are problems of methodology that are unique to tackling the problem of consciousness from a scientific point of view. From a philosophical point of view, that's not a problem. But from a scientific point of view, that's a problem because whole methodology is modeled on looking at the phenomena from outside measuring it and extrapolating and generalizing it 
and all of it are so counter to the reality of consciousness itself, which is the lived experience. So which does challenge the science to open up its conceptual framework, its vocabulary, its methodology, and all of this. And one example that I can give you is that up until the discovery of neuroplasticity, science, neuroscience did not have a way of talking about how experience changes the brain. Once you have the discovery of neuroplasticity, it opened up the whole language. Then there was a way in which the neuroscientists can understand how something like meditation can really impact the brain. So this is the result of getting into these kind of discussions. And I, not just science, but I think on the part of the Indian traditions too, I think there should be a willingness to learn. Because in a genuine dialogue, nobody comes out unchanged. And if we go in thinking that we have all the answers and ours is the final truth and we are there only to share it, then it doesn't really contribute to the dialogue. A genuine dialogue really changes both sides. And that is evident from the long history of Pramana debates that have happened between the Buddhists, Mimamsikas, and Nyayakas, particularly those three schools have debated, you know, since you know, Dignag wrote his Pramana text, you know, sort of opened up the eyes and Kumari Lapata and Uttodakara and all of them jumped on and Dharmakirti came responding and, you know, this, the, over several centuries, the discussion and the debate has been one of the most fruitful, you know, period in Indian philosophical thinking. And that is because both sides were willing to be changed, willing to be challenged, and you know, willing to refine their views. Swamiji. Um, so I want to narrate a simple story by Sri Ramakrishna. Two stories. One is the story of blind people going to the elephant. It's a very famous story. Several blind people went to touch the elephant. Somebody said the elephant like a huge pipe, it has the tusk. Somebody the elephant like a huge fan, it has the ear. Somebody touched the tail, it has a big brush. A quarrel is sure. The person with the eyes came and said, Sir, isn't the elephant this? Yes, you are right. Sir, isn't the elephant this? I said, you're also right. How can everybody be right? Everybody is right, but only partially right. The human mind always looks at truth. But leave alone consciousness and mind. Even physical uh, science does not know what is matter. You ask a physicist what is matter, you have some kind of definition. And biologist does not know what is life. There's so many explanations of life. And is there an bridge between life and non-life? Hundreds of questions come because the human intellect, the human mind wants to look at truth. And we are like, the entire conference of several intelligent brain people trying to look at the elephant. So we did that and we become enriched. And one more story, a person came and said, I saw a small animal in the, on the tree, it was red. So no, I saw it, it was yellow. The third person said, no, it was not either yellow nor red, it was blue. The person said, I live under this tree, I know it's sometimes yellow, it's sometimes blue, sometimes this, it's a chameleon. So Sri Ramakrishna therefore said, the truth has hundred thousand aspects in which it can reveal. And the whole beauty, like nature itself, we are in consciousness. The whole beauty and the grandeur of nature is a hundred thousand varieties which can throw up. It is just like going to a supermarket or mall. So you purchase something in the ground floor, don't set fire to the remainder. You say somebody can purchase something there. The person without purchasing anything goes around and sees it and enjoys the beauty. I will end with a quote by uh, Professor Eddington, he was a famous astrophysicist, as you know, contemporary of Einstein. He said, the well of truth cannot be emptied by a leaky bucket, like the intellect. Thank you. Uh, Just a few sentences. Remembering what he's always said and says all the time, not just talking action. So of course this particular conference is not, you know, to do something immediately, 
and uh, the purpose is to figure out from the different rich traditions the wonderful ideas and values and uh, by sharing these values to each other I'm sure it will make an impact not only with the listeners but among the participants and things like that but so I'm not questioning the efficacy of this conference but what I what was really wondering was I also had the pleasure of attending so many conferences like this and then at the end of the day I'm not sure what we are achieving sometimes you see so I also don't know how to proceed so therefore it may be interesting next time to probably I mean not necessarily this conference but for all of us who go to different conferences to probably have a session where we will try to concretize some of the salient features outcomes of the conference and we make it public from the scientific findings from how the Sankhya tradition has really benefited people give some examples how the Buddhist tradition has benefited some people give some concrete examples and then probably make it public so I think that that is very important as I mentioned when I was responding the science has wonderful ideas but that idea is not shipping through in the mind of the people what is going around is technology and uh, that's how people are harmed, you see, so... Thank you. So now uh, it's time to end the session. I pass on the patron to uh, Keshala. Karuna Sita Lahadayam Panya Pajot Vihat Mortamam Sarnara Maralok Karum Vande Sukatam Gati Murtam his Holiness, distinguished paper presenters, moderators, and observer participants who participated in their deliberations of two-day international conference on mining <clears throat> Indian philosophical schools of thought and modern science, in which scholars of different schools of Indian philosophy and scientists explained the theorization of the respective views on above-mentioned issues concerning mind. As the tradition goes, although Mangalam, Madhya Mangalam, and Priyavasane Mangalam, Adau Mangalam, we were best with the, His Holiness Grace with opening remarks of his uh, the theme out of the, of the theme and the direction of the conference. Madhya Mangalam paper presenters presented with thorough research. Respondents meticulously articulate the discussions. The moderators beautifully coordinated and queries and comments raised by the observer participants. And of course, the mind refreshing concluded remarks of His Holiness for revival of Indian philosophical systems to combat the destructive emotion of mankind for a future world of peace and harmony is a great renaissance. We, the organizers, immensely thank His Holiness for able to grace and Bless this conference even from his uh, busy and hectic schedules. We are also grateful to all the paper presenters and moderators for their hard work and giving time from their busy schedules to attend the conference and making this conference a success. We do recommend, we do commend the observer participants raising comments and questions of importance during the deliberations. We love the translators for providing simultaneous translation during the two-day deliberations. Last but the main least, we love the conference a success, namely due to webcast, electronic and multimedia, footing and lodging, transportation and so forth, to name a few. Once again, I thank you for the, making the conference a success and hope we will always look forward for your participation in many more such conferences in the near future. Akasha sya stitri avacha jagata stiti tavan mama stiti bhuyat jagat dukhani viganata bhavatu sabba mangalam rakantu sabba devata sabba buddha anubhavena dhamma anubhavena sangha anubhavena sadha sokti bhavantu te. So we end here the uh, two day conference. Now it's also the uh, ending of this 2000 year also. So I uh, salute and greetings to all on this new year celebration. Thank you very much. <laughs>